as I've talked about multiple times, either uh, to you personally one-on-one or from this stage maybe too many times ad nauseum, some would say, uh, I love August. (laughs) My one-year-old, 13-month-old son is the best. He's the best 13-month-old on the planet. He cannot be beat. Now, you might be saying that your 13-month-old is the best. And I would say, that's fair. That's fine. You can believe that all you want. Um, But I don't. August is so good. (laughs) Except for this one little thing. This one little piece. Um, Actually, there's a lot of pieces, right? Uh, Fatherhood uh, and parenthood is very hard. I never wanted to come across that we're perfect parents or anything like this. He's uh, uh, a lot of work in a lot of different places. But for simplicity's sake, for the sermon's sake, I'm just going to stick with this one piece. And that is August's sleeping habits. Or, should I say, his non-sleeping habits has been the the bane of our existence for uh, a while now. The past month has probably been the worst month of our lives, uh, sleeping-wise. Uh, that is not hyperbole. That is not, <laughs> that is not something that is like uh, something that's not right or accurate. It has been the worst month of our lives, sleeping-wise. So about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we traveled back and forth and back and forth from Illinois, uh, where we're from. And he doesn't, uh, he doesn't sleep well usually. He definitely doesn't sleep well whenever we travel. He is very particular. He needs his own space and his own two sound machines and his own crib and his own mattress. And he needs all of it in order to sleep semi-well. And we're, when we're on the road, when we're traveling, he doesn't do that well. And then the past two weeks, it has been defined by August having a double ear infection. Thank you for feeling my pain. Uh, Thank you for groaning. Um, Yeah, thank you for that. So it's been fun, right? This is actually the first time. It's miraculous, right? It's the first time that he's been uh, sick or like really, really sick his entire life. So that's a praise right there. But when it happened now, it was like, oh, my gosh. We just feel so bad for him, right? He's so much in pain. He woke up with like just screaming one day. It was so uh, sad to see this little body uh, racked with pain and, and sickness. And then he got some sickness after the double in- ear infection or because of the de- ear infection. I'm not a doctor. I don't know how sickness works. But uh, so he got sick. He got Abigail sick. And then a week went by. And they got better. I was like, okay, you missed me. And then yesterday. I woke up uh, with a cold, uh, with some sinus stuff and with some face stuff. So that is why I sound more Kermit the Frog-esque than I normally do. Uh, I am uh, struggling a little bit this morning, a little bit today. But I am still standing up here, right? (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) You don't need This is too much. (laughs) Does not deserve clapping. Uh, Yeah, I had another line about it, but that's okay. That clapping was enough. So it's this week, right? August is getting over his double ear infection. It's on Monday. Uh, and on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m., we, uh, my wife Abigail and I have a small group over Zoom. We meet together, talk together, all that good stuff. And it's 7 o'clock. And usually when we're at home, I have it down to a science where I can get him into his arms and rock him or walk him or whatever. In five minutes, I can usually have him asleep and transfer it in the crib. Everything's good but not whenever we have stuff to do, right? (laughs) Not whenever it's crucial that those five minutes work. Every other night, he'll be asleep in five minutes, but this night, because he knows that we want to do something else, he decides that he's not going to go to sleep. So 7.05 goes by, he's not asleep. 7.10 goes by, 7.15, and he's still just wide-eyed staring up at me. I don't get it. 7.20 goes by. And I do these little checks, right? You look down, you see if he's sleeping or not, just to, you know, check him out. And I don't know where he got this from, but in the last couple of weeks, as, when I look down into his eyes to see if he's asleep or not, to see if the eyes are closed or not, he will reach up and slap me across the face. <laughs> That's not funny. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I don't know if he learned it from his mom or what, but he will, he will look up at me and say, stop looking at me, Dad. Okay, he doesn't say that, but... It's what he says with his eyes, and so I have to, like, sneak glances now. It's crazy. This kid is insane. Like, I don't get it. Um, Jeans, whatever. But it's 725, right? 729 comes around. Again, small group meets at 730. Miraculously, and and I say that word on purpose, I think by miracle, 
He had closed his eyes, fallen asleep, and transferred into his crib and was asleep by 7.30, and we got to have a good small group session. Guys, despite the sleep deprivation, despite the times where he slaps me across the face and thinks it's funny and fun to do, despite when uh, our children learn to, uh, to talk back to us, when our kids decide to disobey us, when we have to go to fifth grade band concerts, despite all of those uh, rough times within our lives of raising our kids, we love them so much, right? We love our kids. Parents have this innate ability to just go the extra mile whenever it comes to the well-being and the goodness of the future of our kids and loving their children well. They would move mountains. They would do anything for the sake of loving their kids well. It's why we hear stories of moms who are just filled with adrenaline, and because of that, they lift cars up, if only for a second, so their kids can crawl to safety. And it's why we hear stories of dads who gain this sixth sense whenever their child comes into the world, where they can just know, they can sense it, whether they're looking or not, they can sense that their child is falling to the ground, and without looking, just pick them up before they crash to the ground. I don't know what it is, but desperate parents tend to do desperate things for the sake of their children. And the story that we're going to learn from today, that Haley read from, uh, for us today, uh, desperate parents in desperate situations is at the center of the action. A desperate father willing to break social norms, willing to break all these other things, to shove his way to Jesus for the sake of his daughter. We're going to be in Mark 5 today, verse, uh, starting at verse 21. So if you have your Bibles in your laps or on your phones, you can start making your way there right now. Mark 5, 21. But before we do, I kind of want to set up the scene for the story as well as set up the scene for where we've been as a church. So in the last, uh, uh, this whole year, we've been talking about our core values, what it means for First Capital to be First Capital, who, what makes us, us, right? We talked about how we as a church and we as a people are going to deeply care and love people regardless of, of who they are, right? We deeply care for people. That's one of our core values. We have shifted after Easter into talking about how we pursue redemption because Jesus pursues redemption, that we talked about the roadblocks and the hindrances the last couple of weeks on uh, on restoration, on uh, uh, yeah on restoration, and today we're talking about how restoration and redemption takes us from worthless to worthy. That's where we'll be for the next couple of weeks: is how Jesus takes us from worthless to worthy. As you're still finding your way to Mark five, let me set the stage a little bit for where Jesus is. So Jesus is relatively new in his early ministry. So he, he basically just sat on the scene. He's been healing people. He's been, he's been teaching people. He's been loving people well. And he's already amassed not only this huge crowd of followers, but also a crowd of enemies. You see, within that teaching, he thought about how the leaders of the day, the religious leaders of his time, were uh, leading the people poorly. That he just railed against these Pharisees, these Sadducees, and the synagogue leaders time and time again. And turns out whenever you talk against people, they tend to not like it, right? They tend to get a little bit angry, a little bit frustrated, and that's what we find already in his earthly ministry, which makes what happens in our story in Mark 5 a little bit unpredictable and a little bit crazier. Here we go, Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat on the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. He's popular. He's gaining all this sort of stuff. He's gaining all this attention of the people. Then... One of the synagogue leaders, one of the religious leaders of the day, named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and will live. We need to pause here to, to point out something that's pretty incredible, right? Like I just talked about, the religious leaders of the day and Jesus, they were two opposite forces trying to battle it out against one another. It's the religious leaders throwing stones. It's religious leaders trying to come and trapping him within an answer. The religious leaders don't like Jesus at all. And what we find in these verses is that one of them actually comes to Jesus out of desperation. This is unheard of, okay? A synagogue leader, a religious leader coming to Jesus, that only happened two other times within the New Testament or within the Gospels. There are three religious leaders who come to Jesus in peaceful and non-argumentative ways. Jesus and the Pharisees, Sadducees, religious leaders are at odds with one another, mainly because, like I said, Jesus continually called them out 
Call them blind guides, call them whitewashed tombs, call them a, a, den of, a, 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 yeah, a den of robbers. These two groups are pretty much enemies with one another at this point, culminating in them, right? We, we fast forward in the Jesus story, culminating in them being the cause and them being the driving force and Jesus getting arrested and ultimately crucified and murdered. He's, uh, and so this is what desperation leads to. It leads to a person like Jairus, a synagogue leader, running to Jesus. They aren't friends, but Jairus still comes to him. Desperate times truly call for tre- desperate measures, and Jairus, the father, is truly at a desperate time. He's risking a lot of stuff just by being in the presence of Jesus in a non-argumentative way. He's risking his authority. He's risking his standing among his other religious leaders and other Sadducees and Pharisees, the other religious leaders of the day. He's risking a lot just by being there, not only just by being within that group and not going against him. And he takes it a step further by kneeling at the feet of Jesus and falling face first. But his daughter is more important than all of that. His daughter is more important than his standing. His daughter is more important than his job. His daughter is the most important thing. His daughter's life was worth it. Verse 24, let's continue on our story. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. We've got to pause. Sorry to take you into the scripture and then right back out really quickly. But a couple interesting things just within that verse. The first that jumps out to me is that Jesus is in the middle of something. Right, Jesus is going somewhere. We don't know where. We don't have that question answered for us, but he is on a mission. He's going somewhere, and yet, in this interruption, he allows himself to be interrupted. We don't know where he's going, but Jesus immediately drops his plans and his obligations in order to pursue redemption. Jesus is interruptible for the sake of goodness and for the sake of restoration and for the sake of redemption. Jesus will stop at nothing for the sake of people, for the sake of God's image bearers. Jesus will move mountains for them. He is the God who pursues redemption and restoration, even through the interruptions. If we are to be a people, if we are to be a church, if we are to be a group of people that are defined by our following of Jesus, we must take this on in our own personal lives. We must become like this. We must be able to be interrupted. From our plans, our obligations, from whatever we want to do for the sake of other people. We must replace our wants and our desires. A life of following Jesus could easily be defined as a life defined by replacing our wants and our desires with the wants and desires that Jesus has for his people. And his want and Jesus' desire for people is to see them made well and to made whole. Free from addiction, free from all these other things, free from sickness. That is Jesus' mission, to bring, a, uh, bring people back to a place of goodness found at the beginning of creation. The second thing that jumps out to me, that was the first, right, is that Jairus' patience here has to be wearing thin. Right? We got parents in the room. We have parents watching us online today. You understand That when it comes to your kid, there needs to be action and there needs to be some urgency, right? His patience, Jairus' patience, has to be wearing thin. As we find out later on within the story, this is a literal life and death situation where his daughter is very likely minutes, seconds away from death. Jairus has waited until the last second to go to Jesus, uh, not only because like the Pharisee or the synagogue leader and Jesus dynamic of it, but also Jesus just got onto the scene and out of the boat, right? He's waited and has to, had to have waited for Jesus. He didn't want to, he didn't want to have to come to Jesus, but he had to, right? He had to in order for the sake of his kid. But there's this crowd, there's this crowd of outcasts and sinners and lawbreakers that are crowding around Jesus, not only, uh, uh, not only are they the people that need to be away from the religious leaders and away from uh, Jesus especially, but they're also slowing him down. This crowd is stunting the pace at which they can go in order to get to Jairus' daughter. The crowd is slowing Jesus down, pressing in, pressing in around him, and stunting the pace at which Jesus can go. Jairus had to be angry. He had to be fuming angry at this moment. He's risked everything to come to him, and yet Jesus is still taking his time. 
Not only is he possibly risking and ruining his career, ruining his standing with his other Pharisee friends and synagogue leaders. Not only is he relying on Jesus, who has talked down about him, but now this crowd of sinners is slowing Jesus down. And Jairus' daughter is at death's door. There's no time to waste. Jesus has to get going. And instead, Jesus decides to be interrupted again. He chooses to stop dead in his tracks. Verse 25, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Beautiful, awesome power of Jesus. We have to mention that before we get into the other pieces. Let me read verse 25 again. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. This is not only a medical issue. Right? For 12 years she's experienced pain. And she's experienced discomfort. And she's experienced just a life that is uh, defined by this illness. But it's not just the medical pieces that is her issue, that is her problem. But to make matters worse, according to the Levitical law, as well as some man-made amplifiers that have been put upon this culture, this woman is unclean. And therefore, needs to be away from community, away from people, and away from family, away from everybody, because she is, according to the law, based off the law that they had come up with, unclean. This has caused her to be an outsider. This woman is an outcast. She is a lawbreaker. She is unclean. Someone who doesn't belong in that crowd, in that group, definitely doesn't belong by Jairus or by Jesus, according to those standards. According to the law of Moses, the law that Jairus, right, was in charge of upholding and teaching and training his people to uphold. This woman should be immediately sent away from the crowd, sent away from people because of this bleeding that this woman cannot control. The law stated that the woman shouldn't be able to be among a group of people. She should be sent away from the whole community until she stopped bleeding and until she was clean again. And for 12 years, she has waited for that day to happen, and it has not happened. She cannot get clean. And so for 12 years, that has been her story. For 12 years, she has been away from her family, away from her community, away from every semblance of a normal life, away from every semblance of life in general. Her story is no doubt full of shame, full of condemnation, a story full of rejection as people keep pushing her to the sidelines and pushing her away. This is a story of a woman who feels absolutely worthless. She doesn't belong. She's not loved. She's not cared for. Worthless. And so we see that within these couple of verses. We see in the way that she approaches Jesus, she comes up from behind him trying to sneak her way to Jesus in order to not be seen, in order to not be heard, in order for her to not be found out that she is among the midst of this group. But the faith that she has to get new life from Jesus, the faith that if only I touch a little piece of his clothing, I would be healed She fears, the reason that she sneaks up, the reason that she's trying to hide from Jesus is she fears that Jesus will be like everybody else. That Jesus will judge her and forsake her and send her away based off this law. And I don't know if it bears saying or not, but Jairus would have sent her away. Jairus would have said, according to this, you need to go and get yourself clean and get yourself right in order to come to me. The new life that Jairus wants for his daughter, he would have refused for this woman Jairus' job to refuse that for this woman. But Jesus is different. Jesus is different. 
Not only does this woman experience the healing and the new life, the transformation and restoration that is only found in Jesus. Not only is she given a life free from rejection, a new life free from condemnation, a new life free from isolation. She gets to experience the face and the glory and the full love of God found in Jesus in this moment. That is the gift that Jesus gives by saying, wait, 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 wait. let me pause here for a second. Let me be interrupted. I need to seek this person out, which is what we find in verse 30. At once, so as soon as this woman touches his clothing, at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around to this crowd of 20s or hundreds of people and he says, who touched my clothes? A little ridiculous, right? There's people jostling him around, slowing him down. Who touched my clothes? Jesus, are you kidding me? But this is, this is it. Just as this bleeding woman is going to force her way to Jesus, Jesus is going to force her, his way to find the woman. Why? Why does he do this? Is it to find her and to cast her away, to shun her, to tell her to stop sinning and get clean in order to push her away? No, no. Jesus pursues redemption. You see, it's one thing to be healed of our bodily uh, harms and our bodily sicknesses. It's one thing to be healed by Jesus, but it's another thing to see him and to experience the fullness of the face of Jesus, to experience the fullness and the realness of God. It's another thing to come to -to face-to-face with the glory and the love that is found in Jesus. Verse 32, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Again, it's something that we need to take on. That this, not only did Jairus fall at his feet, but this woman fell at his feet as well. Trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This is a beautiful beautiful story of redemption, of Jesus pursuing, of Jesus being interrupted, of Jesus not only allowing himself to have power to heal, but also to have power to restore her full life, regardless of the illness, regardless of the things that are afflicting her, but rather to bring her out of the pit that she's in with the face of Jesus. This is beautiful, but one person's story of redemption, one person's story of restoration leads to a story of sadness and of anger and despair because Jairus is still waiting. Jairus is still waiting for Jesus to go and heal his daughter. And he waits and he waits and he waits. Jairus had already waited until the last minute to get to Jesus. Imagine you are Jairus in this situation. Right? Imagine the anger and the fuming, and, and just this, this, what are you doing, Jesus? I asked you first. This is my daughter. Don't you know who I am? I mean, imagine you're Jairus. Imagine you're this girl's father. Imagine your own kid. There's an emergency, and your child needs to get to the hospital, right? You call EMS. You call an ambulance. They come, and they pick up your son, and they pick up your daughter. And instead of going straight to the hospital, right, the driver takes a good 20 minutes to get onto his Spotify and, and select a playlist before they get going, right? This isn't the exact situation that Jesus is, right? He's not picking a, a playlist, but it's like that. You'd be more upset. You'd be upset if someone was taking your child's life at risk at all. You'd be so mad. You'd be more than upset if you were Jairus. There isn't time, Jesus, the nerve of you to waste time and wait to waste time not only on someone, but on, on the sinner, this low life, this reject. This woman who's not even supposed to be here in the first place. She's supposed to be outside of the community, outside of town. And Jesus not only pauses for healing, but pauses to have a conversation with this woman. Jesus goes out of his way to find her and have a conversation. One minute of waiting for Jairus turns into five minutes turns into 30 minutes, and Jairus has to be fuming. We have to go, Jesus. Verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, while he was still talking to this woman, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? This is heartbreak. 
This is tragic. This is tragedy in a nutshell. It's despair for Jairus. If only I'd run faster. If only I'd been here quicker. If only I'd got to the boat and had just shuffled him away. If only I'd done something more. Actually, no, it's not my fault. It's Jesus' fault. If Jesus had just listened to me, if Jesus had just come with me, actually, it's not even Jesus' fault. This is a woman's fault. How dare she get among this group? How dare she waste the teacher's time? It's despair if Jesus had just gone on and hurried up. But I think, I think Jesus is showing something a little bit more about himself. He's showing more of who he is in this moment. Jesus is showing us something truly amazing about his redemption and about how he pursues it. Before I get into that, I'm going to spoil the rest of the story really quick because it's a happy ending. Jesus uh, pleads with Jairus to have faith. Jesus pleads with Jairus to continue walking with him. We'll go to the house. It'll be okay. Your child is not dead. And Jesus raises this 12-year-old daughter from the dead. And we as readers get to experience two stories of Jesus pursuing redemption. We get to experience the new life found in this 12-year-old daughter and this new life found in, in this bleeding woman. But in reality, this isn't two separate stories. In reality, this is not this happened and this happened. This is deliberately one redemption story. Jairus has a 12-year-old daughter, no, uh, a little bit uh, close to the same age as Haley who read the scripture, right? Jairus has this 12-year-old daughter, and Jesus gives her new life. It's on one hand. On the other hand, Jesus finds a daughter among the crowd who has basically been dead for 12 years. This woman has been bleeding for 12 years, meaning that for 12 years she has been dead to society, dead to her family, dead to love, and Jesus chooses to give both of them new life. Jesus chooses in that moment, so this is not you get to go and you get to have, a, have redemption. No, he chooses that everyone in this story gets to have redemption and restoration. Not only that, Jesus calls them both child, daughter, he gives them a worthy identifier of who they are. He gives them the worthy identifier of daughter. You see, in this moment, Jesus is leveling the playing field. On one hand, you have Jairus, who is well off. He's well to do. He has a lot of money, a lot of influence, lots of powers. It would be a good idea for Jesus to have this guy in his corner, to not make him mad, but rather to go rushing over to his house. It makes all the sense in the world for Jesus to go immediately to Jairus' daughter. And yet, in his mind, this bleeding woman takes and needs the same exact love, the same exact affection, the same exact restoration and redemption. On this other hand, we have this bleeding woman with no influence, no social standing, no money. And Jesus gives both of them the same love, the same attention, the same miraculous brand new life. What we learn from the story of redemption is that there is no one that is too far down, no one that is too far gone, no one that is too worthless, too broken, too much of a sinner, too much of a rule breaker for the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus is all expansive, reaching out to all of us. No matter how far we are on the outskirts or how center we are, Jesus reaches out to us all. When we kneel in front of him, we find that the ground is level at the feet of Jesus. Friends, know that you are not too far anything for the love of Jesus and the worth that he gives you. Jesus finds you worthy of his love and his redemption. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years. For over a decade, she's experienced rejection and loneliness and hurt and pain. But it's even worse than that. I had not looked into, I don't know if I just hadn't been reading the, the Gospel of Mark for this story and, and read a couple of the other versions or just never let it sink down before. But this woman is desperate. I, I'd never known the depravity of her situation. Let me go back to verse 26 real quick. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Not only did she have no one to lean on, not only did she have no one to take care of her, but worse, the very people whose job it was to take care of her, to heal her, have, have not only not solved the problem, but in, or, in this translation, it sounds like they were taking advantage of this woman. Sure, give us more money and we'll, we got the answer, we got the fix. This woman was at the end of her rope. 
She had no other option. She had no one else to look towards. She was out of people. She was out of money. She was out of all options. I don't know what you walked in here with today, what baggage you're hanging on to, what stuff in your life just keeps uh, holding you down, taking you down, but maybe you're finding yourself walking in the same story as this woman at the very end of yourself, at the very end of your rope, and maybe even inching closer to rock bottom. Do you resonate with the desperation that we see in this woman? Have you tried everything under the sun in order to make your life worth it and found yourself wanting instead? This woman had tried everything. She had done everything. She paid everything that she could, and it still didn't give her what she needed until until she finds herself kneeled at the feet of Jesus, until she comes face to face with Jesus, and Jesus doesn't condemn her, doesn't push her away, doesn't say, you first need to get clean, you first need to be free from sin, but rather he meets her not with condemnation, not with shame, not with anger, not with rejection, but Jesus meets her in this moment by calling her daughter, One of the most beautiful verses in the the Gospels, daughter, your faith has healed you. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. He chooses to remind her, to reassure her that she is loved like a child of God. In this moment, Jesus strips away the identity and the label that has held her down for 12 years. He replaces the label of outcast with the label of included. He replaces the label of unlovable with completely loved. And in the same way, I believe he wants to give that same thing to you today. That you are a child of God, a child of Jesus. You are included within the family. And because of that, you are worthy of his unending and unfailing and his always love and redemption that he has for you. The title and identity of son and daughters means that nothing else matters. Everything else falls to the wayside in comparison to a person's child. And you are loved in that way by Jesus. Even despite the sleepless nights. Even despite when he thinks it's funny to slap me in the face, even when our lives are thrown completely out of whack by him, August is one of three things in my life that's worth, worthy of my everything, worthy of all of my love, worthy of all of my attention, all of my work towards his goodness, worthy of being interrupted, worthy of all of this because he's my child, because he's my son. It's not what he has done. It's not what he can do. It's not what he will do in his life, but rather it's just by that identifier. And that is the same love that Jesus has for you. In the same way, Jesus identifies you, son and daughter. The disciple John, who is actually in the room when Jairus' daughter is raised to life, writes this years later, see what great love the Father has lavished for and on us that we should be called children of of God. And friends, that is what we are. We go from worthless to worthy when we recognize our identities as sons and daughters of Jesus. We find redemption when we come face to face with Jesus and we allow him to relabel ourselves. Regardless of our past, regardless of what we have labeled upon ourselves, he relabels us when we come face to face with him. And with that identifier secure in our hearts, we are found secure in his love. And typically, just like the story of redemption that we read today, we find our identity as sons and daughters and become secure in that identity when we kneel in front of Jesus. Jairus runs to him, kneels face in the ground at the feet of Jesus, and the bleeding woman does the same. And in that, they both find their identity as sons and daughters of the Lord. And I think that would be a good idea for us to do right now. I understand that I'm the guy who makes your feet, make you guys' feet firmly on the ground, palms facing the ceilings, all these other awkward things, and I'm going to ask you to do it again because here's the reason for that. Sometimes our hearts and our minds need reminders from outside sources, and one of the best and easiest ways for us to do this is to posture ourselves in such a way that we remind our hearts and our minds the actual place of Jesus. When we kneel down, we remind ourselves of the holiness and the worthiness of Jesus. And if you're anything like me, maybe you haven't done that in a while. 
So let's do that right now. Let's all do that in this moment. If you are not able to, that's okay. That's fine. Jesus is pretty clear throughout the Gospels uh, that your heart matters a whole lot more than your outward appearance. And so if you are not able to kneel in this moment today, uh, that's okay. Kneel within your hearts and your minds. Yeah, if you could just start kneeling. We're going to spend some time with Jesus one-on-one. If you're uh, online through it, uh, watching on a screen, you can do this along with us uh, right now. Kneel wherever you are. And here's what I want in this moment. What I want in this moment is just a time for us one-on-one with Jesus, for us to look face-to-face with Jesus and allow him to relabel us, allow him to do the work of redeeming us, redeeming our self-image, redeeming our negative self-talk, redeeming all of that through his spirit and through his goodness. When we kneel at the feet of Jesus, we come close to him and we realize that the ground is level. You are not too far gone. You are not too far away. You are not too far anything for his love. So awkwardly for the next few moments, we're going to sit in this place of silence and kneeling. And we're just going to ask Jesus to relabel us if we need relabeled. We're going to ask for him to redeem us if we need redeemed. If you've never had that experience of asking Jesus to redeem you for the first time, there are going to be people up at the front near the baptismal. That if you want to get baptized, we want to open that door to you. So in the next few moments, let's spend some time with Jesus. that you would push through anything that's keeping us from you so that we could clearly see your face. Give us the label of son and daughter. Have that become secure in our hearts and minds. So as we worship, we pray that you would be with us, continually reminding us of who and whose we are. pursuing our redemption and our restoration. Jesus, in your name.